So hello, welcome to Product Tank Berlin. Uh, we're back for another lunchtime session. Uh, today we are very happy, happy to welcome Sandra, Tina, and Rainer uh, to talk about the feature factory, how to move away from it into more value-driven teams. Um, I'm going to just pass straight on to, on to them to talk you through uh, the structure of the talk and a bit about the mirror board, which, uh, which they'll be using. So uh, Tina, I'll pass on to you. Share your screen. Thanks. Um, yeah, as, as Sean already mentioned, we're the value rebels. So Sandra, Reiner, and Tine. Uh, we have background in product and engineering leadership. Um, we are, since about a few months, on a mission um, to empower people to identify business uh, value faster. And today, specifically, we want to talk to you about the Value Engine, which is a product management framework that you're going to hear, hear more about later on. But before, um, before we dive into that and explain to you all about how, um, how we're trying to implement this in, in companies where we work uh, and how that's going, um, let's quickly make sure that we have the mirror board um, up and running. Uh, before we go to the opening exercise, please make sure that you have your um, settings for um, navigation mode correct based on your device, whether you're using a mouse, trackpad, or a touch screen. And then, um, Sean, have you shared the link already? Um, we will need a few more people on the board. We will be using the board later on in the presentation to collaborate extensively. So uh, if you join, you can you can participate. You can help us out. You can you can um, basically work with each other. So um, just to make sure that you got the hang of it, I know that a lot of us are already using Miro in in this pandemic times. But just to make sure that everyone is, put your name here. Um, if you feel like it, you can also add your uh, your LinkedIn profile or whatever where you would like to, people to be able to find you. Um, feel free to interact on it later on as you see fit. But for the basic introduction, maybe let's let's give ourselves uh, a minute so that everyone has had a chance. Let's see who we have here. Daniel Reiner is already here. I'm, I'm sorry in advance if I butcher some names. Uh, Agye. Um, yeah. So while everyone gathers and, and puts their names on, uh, I will I will refocus the screen later on when we need to. But for now, um, Sandra, tell us more about the Value Engine. Yeah. Can you hear me, guys? I quickly dropped out, so I hope that you can all hear me. Um, Tina, can you hear me? We can yeah. hear you. All right, sorry. perfect. I quickly dropped out when you started sharing the screen, and I think my microphone and the audio just dropped. Um, so uh, yeah, Sean, if you could bring up the presentation. Awesome. Yeah, I'd say let's kick it off with a proper problem statement like product managers do, right? Um, so what are the most common pain points or challenges that tech companies at scale are struggling with nowadays? Here are just a few that we believe most of you will be able to relate to. For example, useless prioritization discussions that happen over and over again, or missing transparency about who's working on what slow delivery because of maybe doing 100 things in parallel um, and constantly depending on others, missing or too little discovery work to find out what really matters to our customers and business instead of and, and ending up in kind of being feature teams. And last but not least, too much technical depth because the next high prior MVP is already standing in line and also super, super important. If that sounds familiar to you, then stay tuned because we have been struggling with the same issues. And today we want to share a concept that we developed over the last years that helped us tremendously already to solve those topics. But before we get into it, I would like to take you on a small journey with me of a product manager's life. So imagine you are working in an e-commerce company and you are responsible for the shop catalog as a product owner and your CEO approaches you and says, hey, our homepage is really outdated and ugly. Can you create a new homepage for our shop, please? I really believe there's a lot of value in it. 
let's assume you are able to prioritize this new initiative and you start working on the requirements analysis and preparing the backlog. You approach your stakeholders in the business departments, such as uh, sales, marketing, legal, to collect their needs. You check out what the competition is doing and you draft some screens, estimate stories with your engineers in order to reduce uncertainty and make a plan. Maybe if you're fast, this takes like one month and you start development with your Scrum team. The effort investment during the development phase, of course, increases, but during the development phase, unfortunately, the uncertainty cannot be further reduced because you're not live yet, right? Then you initially estimated six prints, but as it happens, right, <laughs> everybody kind of knows the situation, some unexpected issues pop up and it takes not six prints, but actually 10 until you are done. Um, and you spend hours and hours in communicating to your stakeholders why it takes longer and calming everyone down. Finally, you're done. And as you are a modern company, you set up an A-B test to see the difference between old and new homepage. And what you figure out is like a drama to you and the team, because actually the revenue per user in your new version that you are monitoring with 10% of the traffic is less than in the old version. So, oh my God, what have we done? We're actually creating negative value right now. Um, so you try to tweak, introduce, fix some bugs, introduce some new features um, urgently with high pressure. But actually at this point in time, well, you know, a few weeks later, management just decides to kill the project and you trashed probably six months of work. This might be a little bit exaggerated um, or maybe not because actually it is happening in similar ways. Mm, so how can we do that better? We will come back to this example by the end of the presentation again. But now let's first lift ourselves up a little bit more to a theoretical process model level. Um, and I want to hand over to Rainer here. So Rainer, wh what is the value engine that we brought today? What is it? Thanks, Sandra. So yeah, the value engine is basically a framework to deliver more value, right? That's what the name says. It's um, developed in, in practical experience over the last companies that we were working for. Like in every company, we adapted a bit, but of course, tailored it to each company. So we do not advise to just copy it, but tailor it to your needs. It's uh, rather high level and that leaves you a lot of freedom um, to adapt it as you need that, right? It's basically there to connect strategy frameworks, like for example, OKRs, to delivery frameworks like Scrum. Right? It's not replacing them, but we always felt there's somehow a gap between that, right? between what the company wants to achieve and how to put that into delivery. Right? It's aimed to work for small companies and also for big companies. Um, we're pretty sure up to 50 teams, companies, even huge companies, um, could easily adapt that for their needs. Um, so that is basically the background of the value engine. However, um, let's make sure we what set the stage about? right, yeah? yeah. So to set the stage right here, uh, most of you might know dual track agile, right? And the um, value engine is a dual track framework. So we do not only care about what's um, in the backlog already and how, um, how, how, how to develop this, but we care equally as much about how the requirements actually come into the backlog, which is called discovery. You all know that. Both tracks are running in parallel and the full product team is involved in both tracks, some more than others in each track. So maybe the PO and the designer are a bit more in discovery with, together with the lead engineer, the other engineers maybe more in delivery only. Um, but it's, it's important that the full product team is involved in the discovery and delivery phase to avoid harsh handovers. So let's keep that in mind when diving into the single process steps. So what is the first step then, Heine? Yeah, so everything starts with ideas, right? Like I, I saw hardly companies that actually have too little ideas. Mostly uh, the product managers are overwhelmed with many ideas, right? With even too much ideas. And some even try to somehow restrict the ideas how they can be handed in and stuff like this to be capable to manage them somehow. Um, we believe that we should actually leverage the full creativity of the full company and enable everybody to come up with lots of ideas and the value engine is there to manage them tightly. So let's imagine in a certain time frame, um, 100 ideas come in. The value engine is then basically a funnel that makes sure that the strongest ideas survive over time. That means lots of these 100 ideas need to drop out, right? We have 
no specific um, concrete requirements how ideas should be handed in, except that they should be really brief, easy to understand, no big business cases described or something like this, just a few sentences, what's the pain or the gain you're addressing. And then before we move on with the idea, we need to select somebody that leads the idea to the funnel, right? So if the lead is available, actually there can be a decision how to move on. How is that working, Sandra? Well, let's first go to the board and brainstorm a bit, right? So why don't we start with the first exercise here? Ah, true. Yeah, sorry, of course. Um, <laughs> ideas already the first count for us, so absolutely. <laughs> Um, so I, I would like you all to come to the mirror board, actually, and put post-its on the sticky notes on the idea column, how this idea gathering is working in, in your company. Yeah. How do you do that? There are so many approaches, right? Like brainstorming, maybe the most obvious one. Um, Tina, can you set maybe a timer for one minute? So give everybody some time to um, yeah. put their ideation process tools uh, on the mirror board in the in the idea column, that would be awesome. So, what tools are you using? What templating are you using? Um, is there an idea uh, idea intake process in your company? Are you struggling with that? Just drop all your thoughts there. Um, the idea is that this board gets super full in the end, and we can actually also kind of see what other people are doing um, or feel the pain a little bit together if also other people are struggling with it, right? Absolutely, I see, I see a lot of things coming in here. Uh, design sprint, um, using Jira to do this, crazy eight. That's 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 already awesome. Mm -hmm. so the mirror board is also there to later on uh, get inspired by others, right? Not only by us. That's why we would like to have this conversation, uh, this this talk, really interactive with you. That's why we have it. Okay, so Zana, we have hundred ideas now. So what do yeah. we do? <laughs> we start coding, right? All of the hundred. And then we see <laughs> how far we can get. <laughs> no, um, of course, we need to prioritize the ideas somehow. And we need to select the ideas that we go on with. Um, and um, yeah, so, so there are many different ways also how uh, companies approach this prioritization, obviously. Um, it's one of the most discussed topics, I would say, nowadays. Um, some do voting, some do management prioritization meetings, um, some do prioritization based on objectives and key results that are set for from a company um, a broader perspective or quarterly goals, or some even go for a simple gut feeling. Um, and what we did in the past, for example, is we, we met in our product leadership team every Monday afternoon and said like, all right, let's look at the ideas that popped up in the last week. Let's go through them, map them to our strategic pillars and uh, see if we have capacity for them. Um, and then let's decide if we want to move on to the next stage or not. A few things are important here that I would like to um, mention today. First, the selection of ideas needs to happen on a regular basis, I think. So ideally every week, the rejected ideas, the ones that we say that we don't want to do now or we don't want to do at all, um, please make sure that you've removed them from this overview. If you have this installed as a board or so, then please make sure that it's removed from the board because good ideas come back anyway. Um, and you need a clear view on what you are doing. And most important, don't perfectionate this step. Like don't invest like super high effort in order to get this first selection done because the target is actually not to improve the selection here, but rather to become faster in evaluating the potential of the selected ideas in the next step to train your discovery muscle, right? Um, and one last thing, the definition of done of this step um, is that before an idea moves further into in the funnel, please make sure that you have gathered a cross department and cross functional team that is theoretically available to work on this together and to think this initiative through and make sure that everyone can commit on working on it in a focused manner. So um, I see a lot of people already um, uh, busy or maybe still busy on the board um, and we get that energized session during lunch. So if you don't manage to get your sandwich completely, sorry for that. Um, let's move back to the board um, because we are in the second column already, the selected column. How do you guys select and prioritize? Share it with us. Are you struggling with that? 
which methodology do you recommend to the others? Which me methodology did you figure out does not work at all? Just put it on a sticky note out there, please. And we have one more minute to go for that. Awesome. I, I, I would have some uh, see the, the how, how do you do automated selection. I, um, maybe I will comment later on on the Mario board, also encouraging you to do so. Um, maybe we can use the, the board even to collaborate uh, longer over the next few days with with all the audience. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of that would be awesome, right? There is a lot of things that I actually also never heard before. Crowd with comes with an idea. I think this is at least something that everybody yeah maybe faced once, right? Of um, course. Okay, oh. Arthur also on there. That's uh, that's a great idea. Yeah. Nice, the hippo hippo yeah. decision. That's awesome. <laughs> Very common one, very common one. And maybe it's not even a drama if it's like this. Um, if you have a good setup for what you do next, right? What do we do now, Rainer? So next, we would actually pull it into a draft phase. I think it's important that we say pull, because at the, from my point of view, it doesn't make sense if we push more things into the funnel. I think the team, when the draft team, how we call that phase, is available, they should really pull it into it, not have like chewing gum mode where every Friday we have one hour to work on that. Like <laughs> the team needs to clean up their calendar, laser focus on this thing and get the draft phase through as fast as possible, right? So stop starting, start finishing. That's the aim here. Um, but how to do such a draft phase? Let's imagine we had 100 ideas in the beginning, 30 got selected. Let's imagine 20 of them. Um, will actually make it to a draft phase. So we somehow need to now reduce uncertainty on the these ideas, right? What is uncertainty? Um, maybe you know that it's inspired by Marty Kagan, right? It's not everything is from us here in the board. Um, uncertainty, especially about what is the value of the idea? How much will it actually bring? Um, what is the usability? Will people understand how to use it? Is it actually feasible or are, are we asking our engineers to build zero gravity? Then maybe let's kill it right away, right? Um, and also the viability, right? Will it double our customer care costs, right? Or um, is there a legal issue with it and stuff like this? So this is um, what we understand under viability. So the draft phase is there to get the uncertainty about these aspects as down as fast as possible and as with, with limited amount of effort. And we believe that there are mainly four sources that should be pulled for this. First of all, check if the idea actually contributes to your vision and strategy. If not, let's discard it, right? Um, also, make sure that you have somehow a small market analysis. Check what your competitors do. If none of them are doing this, um, most probably this has a reason, right? Or get inspired how they do it and adapt your idea about it. Um, of course, do quantitative data research, right? You have most probably historic data. Um, how much people will be affected by this? Um, make sure that you're aware of this, like dive into that. Um, last but not least, of course, generate qualitative insights, right? Most probably you want to create a prototype or something like this, show that to users to re re real problems of understandings and iterate over your prototype before we actually put it to the next phase, right? Um, the definition of done of this phase is at least at the end of the draft phase, you have a pre-validated concept. You know rather precisely what you want to do. You know who is needed to make will bring the concept live. You know your dependencies, which teams would be involved. And also, last but not least, make sure that you know what metrics you actually want to affect with it, right? What do you want to achieve with it in a quantitative way? Define that now and not whitewashing mode later find some metrics that justify that you did it. Yeah. Um, so that is uh, the, the definition of done um, from my point of view. But again, I would drive you to the mirror board. Um, there are so many ways how to draft ideas, right? Um, let's come all on the mirror board and show us how you do you do that, right? Uh, design sprints, right? For example, user tests, or, which is a part of design sprint, of course. Tina started the uh, one minute yeah. again. Yeah, so that's like heavy discovery inspired. work now. How yeah. do you guys discover? I would like to. What are you using there? Cool. Some some ideas drop in here. 
That's yeah, what's your what's what's your what's your favorite? Yeah, I just come out of a very very cool and intense design sprint, so I'm still in Miro and dot voting mode. But <laughs> there is a lot of other ways how to discover and how to draft and figure out the best pre-validated concept. Press release. Oh, I like this. Yeah. Oh yeah, nice one. Mm -hmm. Customer calls. Yeah, easy. Short on-site polls, also a good one, yeah. <laughs> Release and learn, yeah. We will come to that later, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, Let's people can still go on a little bit on the Mario board with more ideas how to do a draft phase. Um, I assume the next phase, Sandra, will be that we now develop an MVP, right? Most people will do that. Mm, kind of. Uh, yes, I know. Let's let's not start with the MVP directly, um, because I think there is a common mistake. Um, and now this is this is a really important step in the process. I think um, that might help to also change behavior here and there in some companies. So um, we call this phase the hack phase, and we call it hack on purpose. Maybe it's a bit like harsh, um, but it's important that at least the discussion starts around this um, phase. Um, and the goal here is not to create a fully functioning product. Um, the goal is to create something where we can see how the people try to interact with. And um, in, uh, in, in some cases, this can be as a very uh, easy example, it can be an A-B test or a painted door test. Um, and the important thing here is that this phase needs to be super, super short because we don't learn anything while we start to code something now for production. But we want to prepare something that we can measure on production. Um, so we are we are willing to accept at this point in time technical debt. Um, and that's why we call it hack. Um, we take a loan from the technical debt bank. We will pay that back later. But now we don't know what we are up to yet. We don't know if it's going to work. We don't know if it's really going to bring the desired value that we hoped in the discovery phase to reach. But we need to start measuring on production. Um, so the definition of done of this phase is basically um, to have what we call a minimum measurable product. So that when you are done with this phase, you have your, let's say, um, your measurements positioned. Um, you can push the button after this phase and say like, we go live and you start directly see what's the impact on your key success and health metrics that you defined in the draft phase. So that is the most important outcome of this phase for us. And directly after, we see in a second what comes. But I would be interested now that usually this um, phase triggers a lot of discussion and triggers a lot of um, yeah ideas as well. So um, yeah, again, let's move back to the board for one more time. And um, we would be here now interested in, do you hack in your company? Is there a culture for it? Um, how do you measure? Do you start measuring before you actually roll out? Um, or what's your experience with that? How important is it? Do you have any hints and tips for the others here? So we are now in the hack phase. Um, and we see if there is ideas. Seems to be not so common. In the audience, <laughs> <laughs> I have two things coming in. <laughs> yeah, but it's also not such a common like now. Everybody would say like, okay, let's let let's start to get it out. Let's start to roll it out big times already. No, we have something drafted, uh, and why not go full in now? But most so, of yeah. the times, then you realize later that you 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 started measuring too late. <laughs> That's the thing. It's an educational uh, part here, maybe. <laughs> Let's so wait. Or that's, we, we, we have here at least done sometimes, okay. But we also have a no here, so yeah. Why, why no? Is that, I will be interesting to be honest. No, or is the... that just because uh, the culture is not there for it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it should be super common to work on a painted door test or an A/B test to go live with. Um, or to just to just hack something that you can test for a small amount of users. That's the goal, um, to start measuring. 
All right. Good. Now let's um, slowly move further. Feel free to continue your thought here on the board. But let's move to the next phase. So, I know, can we finally start to really code and roll out? So we can at least start. I mean, we had we already coded a little bit in the hack phase, but just to make sure that the, the measurement equipment is in place, right? And as soon as the measurement equipment is there, I think we should should start shipping it. Yeah. Um, let's make it in a, a safe environment. So let's not ship it to all our users because it's still not viable. It's still not fully functional. Um, it's maybe just a pay-to-door test. So let's ship it to a small amount of users and see how they behave, right? And tailor the further development based on the behavior of the user. So we could, for example, uh, have heat maps or something in place, right? That gets statistically significant really fast on small sample size already. And if we see nothing goes wrong there, then we can gradually increase the traffic share. And with increasing the traffic share, we will have more sample size and we can dive deeper into it. We can see how certain user segments behave, for example, right? And if we can't find any issue in this, we can even further increase. So it's a step-by-step -step increasing. Um, and we will learn a lot. So uncertainty will go down, um, hopefully massively to, to, at the end, basically nearly zero. Still, we should be willing to use more technical depth here. Yeah. So let's not try to make it um, really maintainable, extendable, and so on, right? It's still just to gather more insights, how much value we can get out of it. At the end of the ship phase, if the idea survives, maybe half of it drop out to be not uh, not valuable enough, right? Um, but if the idea arrives at, at the end of the ship phase, that's what we call, what we would call now an MVP. An MVP, 100% life to the users, right? Mm -hmm. um, we exactly know how much impact did it made on our users and our customers. So we know actually really how much value we get out of it. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I forgot that hopefully after the MMP is live and we press the button, hopefully something drops out as well here. Because <laughs> we figure out that we were wrong. That would be amazing. <laughs> yeah. So if it's only half of it, like the our small numbers indicate there, uh, that is already like, like a, a good shot, right? <laughs> Most yeah. probably even more. <laughs> So some people already started on the Mario board to, um, to put their ideas how to execute the ship phase. Um, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. And of course, the presentation builds up. So I also see people moving um, yeah. one uh, sticky note from, an, from, from one column to another one. Um, yeah. Of course, that's, uh, yeah, sorry, guys. <laughs> that's totally fine. The um, slides kind of build up. And I think the more we're in the talk, the better it gets clear what we actually want to tell and what yeah. our concept is idea here is about yeah, um, but there are already some cool ideas like friendly user tests uh, fast app release of course yeah that's exactly what we're looking for and of course yeah. i feel free to put concerns or comments or questions right like um, we will try to um, come to the board even after the presentation yeah and make it's there and stuff like this to yeah. collaborate long, long on the board than just for the presentation time frame um, but you see, it's actually a funnel, right? Like in idea, we have lots of sticky notes and then they become less and less and less and less. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. However, I mean, the ship phase can be super long. We will say, um, or super long. It shouldn't be like years long, but that is probably where you spend most of the time on. But it's also worth it, right? If you spend so much time in kind of figuring out what is the most precious initiative, then here you can now invest the coding effort. Um, yeah. And even more coding effort can be invested now in the next phase. Very good. Yeah. The next because phase is that, like. is, that is the tune phase. Um, and I personally love this phase. I would like to see it in more companies exactly like this. Um, so now, from a business perspective, we have basically reduced our uncertainty to almost zero. Um, we know exactly what our initial idea is bringing us in, in, in terms of customer value and probably also money in the pocket. So we can now decide by facts, where do we want to invest engineering effort um, and make it really proper, right? So now it's payback time. 
the technical debt that we built up can now be worked on and we know exactly how much it is worth. So this is the time to make the software maintainable and scalable for the future. Make it completely testable, automated tests here, make it extensible, secure, compl compliant. Like this is all, um, now is, is, the, is the time for this. And unfortunately, some companies either have the tune phase directly in the beginning, <laughs> Um, and then invest a lot of effort directly in the beginning and find out then too late that actually it doesn't bring the value that it's supposed to be. Um, or people forget about it completely because the next initiative is already standing in line. Um, but hopefully um, the concept gets clear here because when you are at this part of the funnel in the end, um, you have made all the work and hopefully by the end of this funnel, there is not so much initiatives actually that you are working on anymore. So you can focus on this. Um, and maybe even some drop out after a ship because you figure out, yeah, it's not going to bring the effort long term. We just leave it like it is and have it as a cash cow. Um, and um, yeah, so up until then, hopefully we have from our 100, 97 killed and only three done, mainly the three with the biggest value. Um, so let's go into the very last exercise on Myro, please. Um, and then you are relieved from work for this uh, lunch session. Um, please tell us about how does tuning work um, in your company? Do you have a um, situation where you are actually able to focus on um, removing technical debt? Um, what is your methodology for this? How do, you, um, how do you make sure that you're tuning the right things? What's your experience? Or does it not work, work at all? <laughs> do you still work on features after the MVP? Or do you stop all the time with the MVP and never come to a lovable product, which like every Oh, I forgot that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we call this here in the tune phase, the definition of done a minimum lovable product. Yeah. Lovable for the engineers, for the PO, for, um, for, for, for everyone. Yeah. From my point of view, this is somehow a promise, right? You promise the engineer, please hack at the beginning. We will give you time at the end to make it great. Right? Or so, trash it along the way. But then you don't fall in love with your code, right? Absolutely. Everything is disposable, right? <laughs> okay. We how to get commitments, I see here. Yeah. 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 We we see that in many companies, right? That's uh, that's yeah. what this is why where the full value of the value engine actually comes live at the end, right? Oh, yes. Somebody says here it basically gets rewritten at this point. Um, awesome. I mean, if you have that stage, that is um, a dream because um, then you hacked it before you were fast. You got the value fast out, you scaled up, and then you see it makes value and you rewrite it from scratch. Why not? Yeah. Cool. So, but I don't know, is this like, what do we need from a company perspective in order to be able to do this? Yeah, thanks for asking. It's um, basically this is an experimentation culture, right? Like um, experimentation is always kind of dangerous, right? If you do an experiment in a nuclear power plant, it can explode, right? So what is actually needed to limit this blast radius, right? That nothing goes seriously wrong, damaging the company, um, so first of all, I think we should try to aim always for gradual rollout, soft launch, everything, right? For a small amount of users, I don't know, a small amount of transactions or in whichever business you are. Um, but if you soft rollout, only a small amount of users will be affected. So not your full business will be damaged. Next thing is you should have an easy and fast release cycle. If something goes wrong, you can fix it fast. You don't need to wait for the next release in six months, right? Um, that means small amount of users are affected only for a small amount of time. But most important is even that you have the measurability in place, right? If you don't have the measurability, you don't see that your nuclear power plant is exploding. Then soft rollout and easy release doesn't even help you because you don't see what happens. So I think soft rollout, easy release, and high measurability, if you have that in place, the blast radius is really limited. And you can basically allow every junior engineer to make releases on a live platform. Staging gone. I don't need it anymore, right? So 
Um, I think it's important that companies focus on these preconditions to encourage experimentation culture. Yeah. Um, let's say a few words only about timing, right? Like, or about sizing. We do not suggest to bring every single bug fix on this board in your company, right? It's basically a company board where all initiatives of all teams are on it. If you bring every tiny bug fix there, you will be overwhelmed um, and you will not see anything anymore. So make sure that the big things are on it and ask your teams to dedicate 70% of their time on the big things, still keeping giving them, let's say, 30% of the time um, to work on small things, keep the lights on work and stuff like this, small bug fixes, right? And they don't need to create transparency about that, but they need to create transparency about the big things, and these should be on the board here. Yeah. Um, having this all explained, Sandra. Yeah. Um, how do we develop the homepage right now? now? From the beginning, how <laughs> it look like with it? Yeah. yeah, exactly. So um, to close the loop here, and that's then already the last slide of um, our presentation. Mm. If um, you are again this product owner and your CEO approaches you again, say like, hey, redo the homepage, because I believe there is lots of value in there. Instead of collecting requirements, why don't you just start to collect a small cross-functional team with all people needed to think this topic through in a short amount of time? And then once you have all those team members, so maybe you need for the homepage example, a designer, a lead engineer, maybe you grab a marketing manager or a manager, um, a colleague or a colleague from the legal department, um, whoever you think is needed. Keep the group as small as possible, though, and figure out with this group together, what is the fastest way now um, to kind of think this idea through and to kind of figure out how we want to and if we want to proceed with it. A popular discovery method, we mentioned it already, is, for example, a design sprint. Um, where the idea is built and tested, um, a prototype is made in just a week to see how customers actually react to it before you invest all the time and effort into building a real product. And that may only take a week. So whoops, the uncertainty drops and uh, effort of course is there, but um, yeah, it's in a short amount of time. If you after that still feel comfortable that you want to go on with the idea, instead of implementing now an MVP and directly go and invest big coding effort, why don't you just take a JPEG of your homepage prototype that you built in the design sprint and upload it to 0.1% of traffic? People might call you crazy <laughs> because it's not doing anything, but actually you can now see how your customers react and interact with it. Um, you can see where they click. You can understand if the carousel banner with the arrows left and right works um, and or if people kind of move their mouses over there like wildly and don't understand what they are doing. Um, create a heat map um, and figure out what, what, what the, what, where the users are um, clicking or where they are. And the value, of course, will go down because 0.1% have an unfunctioning homepage. But you figure out a lot faster where you need to change and where you need to start working on now. So then you go into the ship phase and you figure out what do you start now? Do you start with the upper? pictures, which, which, which area do you start to really turn into functioning code first and gradually develop the different modules step by step um, in the different seg in, in the different areas of your of your home page and deep dive, start to deep dive into segments as well when it comes to measuring. Um, figure out where um, how, how much how much you can increase the traffic um, and then if you already have something functioning, functioning, increase from 0.1 to 5% to 10% traffic. And in this example, actually, it really happened that um, the homepage wasn't even done completely, but the revenue per user was already higher <laughs> on the new version than in the old version, um, even though the lower part was still non-functioning. Um, so why not go to the CEO and say, like, hey, I have more revenue per user. Can I roll it out to 100 um, percent? Why not? Um, but then gradually, I mean, if you have then figured out 100 percent of your users, then um, uh, yeah, then it's time to really tune it. Um, so that is the last phase that we meant. You have your value generated. You can take time um, to now make it really lovable for everyone. And the difference here is, well, um, you can see it with the curves. Um, in um, 
a lot earlier, you actually generated value. You focused on customer and business needs a lot more. Um, you had your feedback channel installed and yeah, created value after one month. So that is um, our stake on how we can maybe make your lives better in the future. <laughs> I that was it. You enjoyed it all. Big thank you to, to everyone. Um, before we come to the Q&A, let's have a small feedback also on the Myra board in the next section here. Um, how did you enjoy it? Um, um, place, place your sticky notes over here just for us so to know what we could improve as well. Get, get creative. Just express yourself however you think, whether it's thoughts posted or get creative. While people are doing this, I think time is precious, Sean, right? Let's maybe we go yeah, to so, Q&A already. So, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, I think it's a really nice way of structuring uh, work to fix these problems. Um, and I have lots of questions, and I'm sure the audience has lots of questions too. Uh, so we have around 10 to 15 minutes to, to go through those. Um, if you're watching and you have a question, then please just post it on the YouTube video. So there should be the comments section on the right if you're viewing on tablet or desktop. Um, and we'll try and get to a few of those questions. Um, I will kick us off with a reflection on a couple of comments that I saw. Like There was a lot of discussion around this topic of technical debt and how it's handled within uh, the framework that you provide. Uh, so for example, there was uh, this comment here around uh, you know, you talk about this notion of borrowing from the technical debt yeah. bank and how this feels good. This feels like something that we should be doing. It's better to do this earlier rather than later. Um, and then there was a response to this, which I think leads to a question, um, which is, well, this is a nice idea, but people tend not to trust that debt will be repaid or you promise that debt will be repaid. And we've all seen that not happen when the promise is made, right? So, this is why, why leadership is so important, right? Like the, the yeah. leaders need to establish this trust, right? Lead by example and show them, hey, you get the time to tidy up. We're not done with the MVP, right? So if you ask them to commit on hacking in the beginning, make sure there's some trust already there. Yeah. And maybe one more uh, reflection. Um, if, if you just start with such a process and the company is used to doing different in the past, then um, maybe try to figure out a fairly new idea to get into that and not like try to um, get all that freedom that you want there with an idea that is already on the plate and has super high strategic impact um, for years because then already from the beginning, the tension and the pressure is very high. So um, also choose wisely how you want to introduce such a new behavior. I was also curious to product this from the angle of this being the funnel, right? So a really key part of this is that you lose things at every stage. Mm -hmm. um, and again, this is something we know that people are resistant to, which is why this approach could add value. But there's a question of how do you get people to be used to letting go of the idea they've worked on or the stakeholder to admit, okay, we don't have the evidence to move to the next stage. Do you have any suggestions of how people can uh, implement that uh, so that those behaviors do actually happen and it is a funnel and not just a long pipe. It's it's not easily done, of course. It's Basically, it's a mindset. Um, like everybody should, should celebrate saving the company some effort riding what I say it would call a dead horse. Yeah? So try to falsificate your ideas try, or, or at least find potential problems with the ideas early. Your A-B test will maybe only show you does, does it work or not, but not why. Yeah? Maybe a small improvement that you could actually reveal in the early discovery would make the same A-B test positive. Yeah? So get into the mindset of why it might fail. Let's identify that early. Let's not try to, to justify um, that the idea is good. Let's try to find evidence that the idea needs improvement or if even needs to be discarded completely. Yeah. yeah. And just from an operational perspective as well, I think now if you just uh, like what, what we did operationally is like we, of course, we didn't have a PowerPoint presentation with the initiatives, right? So we did that in Jira, but you can also use other tools. Um, but now just the simple transparency of how much is in what state mm -hmm. <laughs> and 
why the hell do we have everything that we had before now also in ship? <laughs> that doesn't make sense. That doesn't fit to capacity. <laughs> Just a simple fact to have this transparency helps to um, uh, enforce the discussion. Maybe maybe just um, another thing on top as to what, what mindset wise could help you um, get into this funnel of reducing the topics that you have. As is a nice quote from Steve Jobs, uh, I'm as proud of what we do as I am of what we don't do. Yeah. Be proud of what you don't do. Be proud of what you did not release to your users, right? Look at the best products in the world, like the, uh, I don't know, the Google search homepage is nearly white. I assume there are many stakeholders inside Google that want to get on the page, right? Still, it's nearly white. <laughs> okay, so the next, next question, which I think maybe follows on from this a bit as well, is moving from the theory to the practice. Um, so, yeah, what's the team set up to execute the value engine? Um, and if I might just add something to this, I'm curious about both the team setup of the teams themselves, and also if you see someone being in charge of this process, or a team being in charge of this process, who is that and, and how? Mm -hmm. Do you want to answer this, Anna? Yeah. Um, well, from into that challenge with your, with your client at the moment, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I think um, it depends on the size of the company, right? So um, if you have um, a situation where you are in a, in a product department where there is like maybe 10 to 15 product teams um, with 10 to 15 product owners, um, and then maybe you have a small product leadership team, and then you can just decide in the small decide upon this in the small product leadership team that you want to work like this, um, and then drive it from this leadership team onwards, and also take responsibility for setting it up, um, for maintaining it, and for coaching um, uh, uh, the the. Uh, the, the execution of this, because that's like the word execute means a lot there in this in this question, because actually it's a lot of coaching opportunities that you generate. It is a maybe you can even see it and transfer it to a it's a leadership tool. Um, I used it a lot to 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 lead and coach um, my um, uh, product managers um, or my, my my team to say like, all right, hey, um, we have, we have a situation here now. So how do you discover this initiative? Can I help you there? What's your, um, what's your plan for the next phase? Um, uh, should we exchange in the team about how other people did that versus um, how you will do it right now? Do you need something from me? Do I have an obstacle here um, on the management level that I need to that I need to fix? Like, do we have always the same discussion about dependencies? Maybe there is something wrong in the team topology, right? <laughs> uh, so it's it kind of triggers a lot. So I think the ownership should be with, with the product leadership team, um, and then now when it scales up. I think there is more and more um, companies that from a certain size onwards kind of create something like product operations departments um, that kind of execute and facilitate such a process. And that could then be, depending on the size, also an opportunity. Yeah, but for an individual team, right, it's, I think it's important that also the team setup evolves through the process. In the beginning, in the draft phase, you try to make it really diverse, right? Take people from other departments and make <laughs> Ah, this okay, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if that was meant with a question, but I, I think worth mentioning it. So, and then over the time it evolves, right? Like later in the hack and the ship phase, of course, more and more engineers need to participate in that, right? In the beginning, you maybe have only one engineer to have the, the technical expertise in it, and later on, you need to, of course, more to build it, right? So the, the team setup is not really stable. Right? Yeah. It's True. Sorry, I don't know what was meant with the um, with, with the question actually. Which which team? <laughs> I'm I'm also guessing that theoretically, if you were a product manager with a team, you could try and implement this kind of process pr without the leadership buy-in at the initial stage. Like you could try and do these steps. Ab absolutely. You might find it challenging. Ab <laughs> but absolutely. Maybe it's a yeah. good starting point. Yeah, it's a good starting point to hold on to. It's kind of like Reiner said in the beginning. Um, it's 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 a good addition I, for me. That was it was enlightening because I always felt like my God, there is something missing. There is those goals, and then there is the Scrum process. But what's in the middle? <laughs> um, so that can be used in, in various different situations and levels. Yeah. 
Um, and then the next question uh, that I'm picking out is, yeah, what kind of software do you ap apply this approach to? It's a, um, does it not work in some circumstances or should it apply so, to all? Nice question. So, I mean, first of all, it applies in situation where Agile makes sense, right? But let's be clear, Agile does not make always sense. Agile is a methodology that makes sense under um, the situation that you have high uncertainty. Yeah. Um, if you're certain what you really need, I think Agile, you don't need Agile, right? Um, next thing is, of course, it works much better in B2B concepts and in B2C concept, uh, situations in the B2B setup it's much harder, right? Because you do not have all the tracking in place and stuff like this. You depend more on what your customer's opinion is instead of um, being able to see statistically significant customer behavior. Still, we believe it can be also used in B2B situations, but it's a little harder to apply, right? There's, it's harder to reduce uncertainty in these situations. Um, so I would say for most digital products, you can use that. For some are... Uh, easier to to apply it and others are harder. Mm -hmm. And here's a variation on the same theme. So uh, what about in a situation where the discovery and development is not done in-house in the same company? Hmm. Um, can you apply it and what would be needed to do that? Is tech, is tech then actually seen as a value creator or is that just a cost center in such companies? Um, so I'm... I'm if you use people from external, it's fine, but make sure it's not like a, a big framework, a big, big uh, contract. This is what we want to have. Um, mm. Make sure you pay them on a daily rate or something like this, right? So they can adapt the plan all the time. It's not plan fulfillment. It's really value delivery. Um, but uh, I believe that this should, the, the, the major thing should be to transition that internally. So mm. your tech team as a team that actually creates value as a profit center to speak in the MBA -ish way, right? Um, your tech team is a profit center and not a cost center. So don't try to outsource it. You will, also all the coaching will not work then and so on, right? So I'm, I'm rather, I wouldn't say generally no to that. There are situations where it makes sense, but I would be rather skeptical, externalize your product development. Right. Product is the heart of your company, right? What, what is a company like? A comp how does Elon Musk say a company is an assembly of people that provide a product or service? Yeah, so that's the main purpose for the company. Don't externalize that. <laughs> so we have time, I think, for two more questions. Mm -hmm. We'll have to be shortish in the answers, um, just to give you the forewarning. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we have this question How often does the first stage of the value engine get executed. So even if, you know, generally it isn't that people are explicitly following this framework in its exact structure, but you mentioned what happens in the first stage. Do you see that happening in practice? Uh, and how often, if so? Yeah, I assume the first stage is meant with the, I, I, from idea to selected and maybe from selected to so the prioritization yeah. part. Um, well, we did it in a couple of companies already um, in a pretty successful manner. And um, I um, it, I think that, you know, what it, it's to find this routine. <laughs> well, it's like if you start to go running and you didn't run in two years, then to get that routine going is pretty hard um, and it hurts. But once you found a routine where you have set your... Um, uh, yeah, your, your your routine meetings or your routine participants in the meetings to kind of go through, uh, through the ideas and say like, okay, what's new? Does it fit to the objectives? Okay, no, it doesn't. Okay, it does. But actually, we have a lot of capacity mismatch here. So, okay, what do we do? Um, how do we involve the stakeholders also in giving feedback on this and stuff? So, it's it's about continuous improvement um, on this step, but just get into it, right? <laughs> yeah. Sure so, I would advise for at least doing it weekly, like the idea to select it. Right. So give feedback, give idea givers feedback fast. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not a quarterly process. Right? One more. <laughs> I know we need to be short because if you're not <laughs> fast in giving back, in, if you're not fast in, in, in reacting to an idea, the idea gets bigger and bigger. 
um, mm -hmm. and there is more and more stuff added to it. And then it takes forever in order to figure out what is meant with this idea, because people tend to kind of try to fight for it and then put more and more information on it. Um, so that one more reason to do it on a regular basis. Makes sense. Um, so I'm going to slightly cheat with what I said and show you two more questions at once <laughs> and then you can just ask them together. Uh, so one which just feels very related again is which column on the board takes the most effort and the other which is just something to kind of finish on um, is yeah do you recommend any uh, blogs, podcasts, books to read uh, that relate to this topic other than the classic Marty Kagan books? Yeah. <laughs> I, read, I recently read uh, the No Rules Rule. It doesn't really, mm -hmm. it's more into culture, right? It's not about this topic, but I can recommend it, of course. Um, the most effort is actually, from my point of view, in ship and in tune, right? These take longer. Make sure the build, the, 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 the hack phase is short. You don't learn anything. Do that in a week or maximum two. Um, and then you see if you can actually move the needle in ship far, high enough that you're confident it makes sense to invest more time there. And if not, you discard it and stop in that phase, right? But there's the highest effort going into it. At the mm. beginning, make sure that you first apply tools that generate insight cheap. And if you're still confident, use slightly step-by-step -step more expensive tools to generate more insight. Yeah. And regarding book recommendations, um, uh, Marty Kagan's second book is also like, I, I, I always think like, oh my God, no, I can't now. Yeah, again, no, but no, okay, he's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. So if, if there would be a book about the value engine, maybe one day we write one, we would of course recommend it now. <laughs> yeah. Not available yet. It probably takes at least a you few months one, to get that ready. And kick our asses that we sit down and start working on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And another comment in the chat, which is echoing the recommendation for no rules. Um, so maybe that's a good one for people to look into. Yes, absolutely. Um, Very yeah. inspiring one. And a, a book where you feel like, what, really? <laughs> Netflix works also that way outside the US, right? That's also what they mm. say in the book. It's not only because that wasn't a comment that is applicable to Silicon Valley. It needs to be adapted for other regions, but it still course, works. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So, um, yeah, sadly we've run out of time, um, but I hope that um, you've enjoyed speaking. I think it's uh, been really interesting to hear you talk through things and it was really great to see a lot of good questions and engagement on the Miro board. Um, I know you mentioned earlier this idea of people are welcome to kind of keep collaborating on the Miro board. Um, maybe you could just give a quick a uh, sentence or two about this? Like, are people free to leave comments or what, what's the idea? Yeah, this? so the mirror board stays open, right? Like, um, leave comments there, start a discussion there. Um, if you're actually locked in with the mirror account, uh, you will get notified about replies to your comment, right? We would love to see a discussion there and we will actively participate in that. Yeah, definitely spend some time in the evening today to walk through the board and comment back. No. And really, thank no. I, I thank you to everyone. It's a, it's a bit weird if you don't see the people, right? But thanks to everyone out there for listening and for really being so active in this lunch break. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time, your interest, your participation. Awesome. Yeah. And all your feedback as well at the end. Thank you. Yeah. So thanks so much for speaking. And um, yeah, if you have any further comments, uh, if you're watching, then as they mentioned, feel free to uh, follow up on the mirror board. Um, or approach us on LinkedIn, right? Yeah. Approach us on LinkedIn if you like, right? We're, we're, uh, gates open, doors open, right? Thanks very much and have a good day, everyone. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for bye -bye. having bye -bye. us. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye.